All right, let's go ahead and begin. So again, just to wrap up uh, anthropology, and yeah, hopefully, again, thank God for uh, lozenges and water and all this fun stuff, and Jimmy uh, Pren, our uh, tech guy, comes here at the end of the day yesterday, he's going, man, it's like a really strong menthol eucalyptus <laughs> smell up here. Yeah, after 30 lozenges dissolving up here, don't light a match. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, who knows what's going on here. All right, so last part here of our um, anthropology is what we are. <clears throat> it's going to be um, substantive theological psychology. And... It's called substantive because it's dealing with our very substance, our nature. What is, what is the intellect, will, and emotions as part of our, uh, our makeup? And, you know, the intellect, <clears throat> the faculty of the soul that knows, deliberates, and assents to the truth of what it knows. The will, it's called the appetitive faculty or power. Uh, what the intellect knows uh, as the object, the will has a desire for it and chooses it, okay? So again, those are just simple functions we all know we have. You know, you just, you deliberate and you identify things as good, true, beautiful objects, and yet you have a desire for one over the other, okay? And you choose them, okay? That's the, the different functions of the intellect and the will. And then emotions <coughs> are the spontaneous movement consisting of affective responses uh, of the specific apprehended object. For example, um, the idea of being agreeable or disagreeable, you love it, you hate it, you value it, you disvalue it. That's really what the emotions are all about, <clears throat> are those affectations. So if you look at the if you look at the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, so you look at the two basic models that are offered. The Thomistic model has the intellect first and then the will. Why? Because the idea is that the intellect has to be prior to the will because the will simply can't desire anything unless it knows something. Uh, it has to be an object, something for you to, to be able to desire for you to have a desire for it. So the intellect has to come first. Now, in Scotus's model, essentially the, this, this was really developed by Scotus in the sense of how do we make sure the will stays free? And, <clears throat> and we talked about free choice or free will at the end of ECD1, but in this case, the idea of free means free from external causation, uh, free from immediate, efficient external causation. And in this case, Scotus's view has been a, a minority view throughout the history of the church. It doesn't make it wrong by being a minority. The question is, does it even make sense that you've got the will prior to the intellect? Um, and, other, and, and the reasoning is, Again, to make it free from anything, including the deliberations of the intellect. Uh, so, but go ahead, explain to me how that's done, where you can have a desire for something where there's no content. So, yeah, that you can have that appetite for something where there's no content to it. Now, again, while the motive, like a lot of theological motives, may be pure, the question is, is that really does that really solve the issue by doing it and really account for all the data? So, <clears throat> so in this case, I think the answer is no. But then you get to um, the problem of this, and when I talked about this before the break, our problem is we have the wrong kind of appetites. We have that as Christians. Why? Because you believe false things about what it satisfies in life. Um, like I said, you didn't get the, uh, your mind reformatted you, know, you still, we still believe all sorts of junk. We have appetites for things that don't really satisfy, but we believe they do. And what we think is good, what we think is beautiful, what we think really is going to bring us joy or pleasure doesn't really. It's something that God has not authorized. In the end, it doesn't really uh, help us. 
So that's the problem of, you know, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that's why the, while God gives you a new heart, so your innate inclinations may change, the mind, <clears throat> and as I say, your difference between occasional and dispositional knowledge. Um, <clears throat> very important distinction here. You can distinguish between your event of thinking a thought, the occasion. Okay? Right now, each of you are having an event or an occasion of thinking one thought. Okay? So that'd be occasional knowledge. And at the same time, you clearly know more than what you're thinking of at any given moment. Okay? That's part of your very nature, disposition, and so forth, character. It's, uh, point is, your substance. You have ideas stored in your substance somewhere, and you value them at various levels. And they, how you value certain things translate into, again, what you remember, again, your knowledge is stored somewhere in there. The fact that you remember something means that it's stored somewhere in you <clears throat> for you to be able to recall it. So, and as I said, that's why physicalism is just never has and never will account for something as simple as memory because uh, there's nothing in the human body that's changing moment by moment that can account for stored propositions and images and skills and uh, those sorts of things that you can recall at any given moment. So this dispositional knowledge, though, the problem is, is that we've got all sorts of things that we believe are true, good, beautiful. And thing is, we may misidentify what really is good, true, and beautiful, um, either actively or just uh, in, at a subconscious level. Um, but that subconscious level, the thing about it, it's one thing to have an appetite for something of the thing known, but even your inclinations and desires, when they stay at that subliminal level, are going to incline you in a certain direction. Okay? And that's why really fixing your soul means to constantly confront lies, which means you got to do what? Know the truth and the truth will set you free. Sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. Take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. I mean, the emphasis is constantly truth, 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 truth. That's what is going to uh, re-incline your souls to the proper perspective and holiness. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Let's give another hand for Laura. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, say, all right, see, <clears throat> now she likes you guys, so you can, um, you know, you got at least one favor now. You can ask of Laura if you need it, so you can do that. Okay, so, so anyway, I, the bottom, bottom line is the doctrine of sanctification is, is big. Why? Because, look, God called us to be holy, and we're going to move, this is a good transition for where we're going now, but. Um, holiness. Now, so now, get out your homardiology outlines, and <coughs> problem is, is that we're not holy, okay? Because think about who we are as human beings. We're told God's God has a pretty, pretty simple plan. Be holy, for I am holy. Okay? Now, that fits with the purpose for mankind, which is what? To walk with God, to uh, enjoy koinonia, fellowship. Uh, the problem is, as the Bible says, how can two walk together unless they are as one? So, which means what? It means you both got to want the same things, desire the same things, enjoy the same things. In other words, 
you need eHarmony.com, 29 dimensions of compatibility. And um, so, yeah, so we get, if you have that, you have eternal harmony with God. Um, but here's the problem. See, God not only is immutably inclined to holiness, he actually knows in every instance what holiness is as well. And in the problem of man as limited, created, uh, contingent, uh, mutable beings is that <clears throat> even though we can start off believing what's true, we can change our mind into believing believing something's holy when it's really not. We can believe something is good and true and beautiful when it's really not. And then when we identify that, what the problem is, then we have an appetite for it and we want that thing that we've misidentified. So when that happens, okay, what's missing? Shalom, peace. Um, the idea of walking together with someone in harmony, uh, I mean, there's no, it's more than an absence of conflict. It means that you're actually compatible and want, desire, and enjoy the same things. That, that's the shalom and the blessing that comes from it. So what we have is broken shalom with God and each other because we're not holy. And, but yet we're designed, because we're in the image of God with the law written on our heart, we're not happy unless we're really experiencing true holiness. So, and that's why the world is full of misery. And no matter what we try to do, guess what? It doesn't fix the misery. With mankind, it might mask it temporarily, but it doesn't really fix the problem. So, <clears throat> so we think about these inclinations, desires. Um, we get to the point where man was designed to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. If you've done this, you fulfill the whole law. So it's be holy, for I am holy. That's the job description of humankind 24-7, 365, without ceasing. Damn, that's what we're supposed to do. And we don't. So, so now, God created man in his image, and who knows how long... Adam and Eve went in the garden without sinning. N nobody knows. Like I said, get to, you know, get to heaven, get to theology 1001. I have my list of questions, you know. How long did they actually go without sinning? Um, you know, just like, uh, you know, uh, what did Balaam's donkey sound like? Mr. Ed or Eddie Murphy? You know, <laughs> important theological questions like that that I want to have answered. So, <clears throat> but either way, um, Point is, is that they did go along for a certain amount of time without sinning, just as the elect angels have never sinned, okay? They, they went through their time, seemed to have survived a time of probation, where after which they were confirmed in holiness. And which, by the way, you know, however long that is, but a from the creation of Adam to the point where we have the new creation and, and the resurrection, who knows how long that's going to be. But all of the biblical data seems to indicate that there isn't going to be any more sin after that in the sense that we're not going to risk falling again. As the descriptions of, uh, you know, for, for example, the book of Revelation, Revelation 21, there'll be no more tears, no more crying, no more pain for the, for the former things have passed. So, because those are the tears, crying, pain, that's the result of sin. There's no more of that, right? So... So that seems to be minimally a time where we're going to be, whatever we are, we're confirmed in righteousness. And even though we continue to be limited, mutable beings, we're not going to ever change again to be inclined to sin. So, so that's a, uh, <coughs> seems to go along with what has happened with the angels. So now we have mankind who, people ask the question, how could Adam and Eve sin in the garden, right? Well, that, that's easy. Close your eyes and make something up. <laughs> Being made in the image of God, God gave us a lot of creativity. And one of the way, improper ways you can express creativity is to invent false scenarios of reality. And if you invent it and then you have an appetite for it, then you're inclined to believe it, you have an appetite for the wrong thing, which is 
The same as, uh, I mean, think about this. Who invented atheism, right? Or pantheism. Th those aren't real scenarios, but at some point someone had to say, I'm going to ignore reality and create a new one. Okay? And the same thing with Lucifer. How could an angel in heaven do that? Well, a third of the angels did that. They had reality right in front of them spiritually, and they did the equivalent of closing their spiritual eyes and inventing a new reality. I can be like the Most High. Okay? So, and then once you invent the lie, and you think it's going to be better, a better scenario, something that's going to produce more happiness, joy, or whatever, you have an appetite for that scenario. So, but the reality is, is God is God, we're creatures, the universe is designed to be in harmony when the creatures, since we are creatures, actually do the will of our creator, who really is the creator. So that's reality. And when we try to be the creator, we think we're like God, then things are out of harmony because now we're rebelling against proper authority. Uh, we're not in submission to God, our creator. So <clears throat> the result is conflict. Okay? Or probably the best way to express the doctrine of sin is things are not the way they're supposed to be. Okay? That's, and everybody knows it. That's why every religion has some notion of a utopia that we're supposed to get to. Does anybody in the world believe we're in utopia now? Yeah, no, except for, you know, there's special rooms with white coats and pads and things like that. Uh, they might think they're in utopia. Uh, but uh, the reality is, is everybody in the world, whether it's atheistic communist and getting to the classless society, or whether it's Shangri-La, whatever, you know, <clears throat> or for the reality is we get to the kingdom of God. So nobody believes that we are in the best state of existence right now. We have an idea that things are not the way they're supposed to be. So, and that's really the, the key for understanding the doctrine of sin. <coughs> so, but the main thing is, is that we start off with, look, we're creatures designed for God, and until we find God, that we're just going to be at war. We're going to be at war with God. We're not going to be at peace. So, so that's why, what do we need? More shalom in the home. That's what we need. So now, what is sin and its effects? How do we flesh that out? And so now we move forward. Look at your homardiology handout. Um, let's look here at... Uh, the Biblical Concepts of Sin, page 1. And again, as you see, there's sort of a primary and secondary type words. But both in the Old and the New Testament, whether it's chatha or hamartia, both mean to miss the mark. Okay? And what's the mark? The holiness of God. Okay? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know, Be holy, for I am holy, but we're not holy. So we've missed the mark of, of universal and perfect holiness. Now, <clears throat> a couple of theological definitions of sin. Um, look at the bottom of page one. It says, sin is any want of conformity unto our transgression of the law of God, or sin is a lack of conformity to the moral law of God in act, disposition, or state, and all the rest of the uh, definitions say essentially the same thing. But anything that makes us incompatible with holiness is sin. Okay? That's it. Again, whether it's attitude, act, nature, if it's something that doesn't incline us to holiness or an act of holiness, then it's sin. <laughs> it's missing the mark. Okay? So, in fact, I had this in my syllabus for years, but I had a former student just... Uh, really last last night emailed me and says, you know, can we sin in our sleep? Okay. Maybe you can, but I don't know. So, uh, <laughs> well, I don't know. The fact is, if you, you have bad dreams that are produced by a, 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 a subconsciousness that is not directed to God, yeah, I, I think that's, that, is that pleasing to God? 
you know, to have a subconscious lust for X or that you shouldn't have, yeah, that'd still be displeasing to God. But as far as on a human level, I mean, there are weightier matters of the law and that God didn't get, you know, God had 22 capital crimes in the Old Testament, but he didn't give capital punishment for every violation of the law. So the idea is, is that while any lack of holiness is a sin, it doesn't mean that every sin is equally grave. So it just means that, look, unholy is unholy. Uh, whether it means, you know, uh, you know, premeditated murder, or whether it means, you know, a failure to help someone, even in, in a negligent way. So, so all of those can be a lack of holiness, but <clears throat> one's clearly more culpable than the other. So <clears throat> now look at uh, page two and let's take a, this is going to be important stuff because to really get sin, which by the way, this isn't a how-to manual. I know you know how to <laughs> sin, okay? Uh, this is understanding the doctrine of sin. So let's look at this as it's connected ultimately with what? The righteousness, law, and justice of God. Because you really can't understand sin until you understand righteousness and the expectations that come from it. So start with what I already said, and that is God requires perfect righteousness from his creatures, period. And that's Leviticus 11, 1 Peter 1, 16. Be holy, for I am holy, period. That's it. Um, but then you look at a, a passage like James 2, which is, if you don't understand <coughs> communitarian notions of justice, people scratch their head on, on passages like this. They say, well, you know, it just doesn't make sense to me um, uh, why these, these things should be what they are. But look at James 2. It says, whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles in one point, he's become guilty of all. Okay? Now most people are going, I, what? That didn't seem right. Well, actually it makes perfect sense when you think about it in the context of relationships and holy relationships, and here's why. Um, <clears throat> when you look at... Um, the idea that the absolute necessity of justice and holiness. See, how many sins did it take for God to separate from Adam and Eve? You know, one, that's it. Well, why? It's actually pretty simple. If you look at, for example, uh, I list a number of passages there, but Habakkuk 1.13 is pretty clear. that Arguing the necessity of the absolute necessity of divine justice based on the nature of God, I, I think it's self-evident because God is an immutably holy being. And thus, God is, has a constant will, but even his essence, a constant inclination to holiness, goodness, and these things. So what does that mean? It means that God can never ever look at hugging a baby and murdering a baby the same, okay? Because uh, causing evil and harm, anything that goes against his immutable inclination is something that he can't approve. He can't have fellowship with. You're not walking together in that direction. <clears throat> Habakkuk 1.13 says in a nutshell that of God, your eyes are too pure to approve evil, you cannot look on wickedness with favor. And that's just, um, again, one of many type of verses like that. Well, it's true. An immutably holy being can't look on wickedness with favor. So, now in my Monday night lecture, I gave this example. But this is where it comes from here. It's that, look, I'd make the case that no being with an inclination to holiness, can ever really approve sin. And, you, and what's the natural result of any evil? It's that you no longer want to have, you don't want to have fellowship with it, you're repulsed by it and want to separate from it. And the example I give is, for example, when I was at the, uh, working at the uh, California Court of Appeals 
during law school working for an appellate justice, I, uh, uh, I drafted uh, crim law opinions for this research and drafted opinions for cases that were coming up from the, the lower courts. And uh, last two cases I worked on, one was a baby murder case and the other was continual sexual abuse of a minor under age 14. Okay. And just real quickly, what were they about? Um, first, two druggies, man and a woman, shacking up together. Uh, the man didn't like her nine-month-old baby crying all the time, so he picked up the baby and slammed him on a concrete floor one day and killed him to shut him up. Okay. Or is that second? Uh, another two druggies shacking up together, a man and a woman. A uh, woman had her kids in foster care when she was in prison, got out, got her kids back, and one of her daughters was 12 years old. Uh, well, when she went off to her drug rehab meetings, uh, the guy was home raping the daughter every week while she was off. But she didn't want to say anything because she finally got back with her mommy after being in foster care for so long. So this went on for almost two years until finally she broke down at school one day, was crying her eyes out and told a teacher. And of course, we cops moved in, did what they should. Now, why do I tell you that? Because you being in the image of God with a new heart and the Holy Spirit, you have the best moral compass of anyone on earth. And you could never look on those two things with favor or be indifferent to it. That's why I see your, when I said those two things, I, if you're a normal human being or a Christian, your heart is just going, that's disgusting. That's awful. Exactly. And so what's, so what's your natural, it's repulsiveness, separate from it. Okay. Which is, again, what's God's natural reaction to sin, to separate from it. So, and how many times does it take? How many baby murders does it take for you to be repulsed by someone? Okay, one. And <clears throat> this is why, see, I would argue, while theologians disagree, I think it's demonstrable that this is an absolute necessity of justice. In other words, the, re the particular reaction to the, to the evil is to separate. That's the natural consequence of evil and sin. And so what do we call that? <clears throat> Spiritual death. <clears throat> That's going to be a natural consequence uh, of, of evil in relation to God. So, mm -hmm. now the tea's too hot. So, all right, let's get this going. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so now, as you consider this, now, what do we mean by divine righteousness as we sort of move forward a little bit conceptually. And now, <clears throat> it's pretty simple. I think about righteousness. We'll distinguish internal righteousness and external righteousness, okay? God's internal righteousness is what? His attribute of righteousness. <coughs> but what is, what is righteousness? It's normative. It's the way things ought to be, okay? So we call this, with respect to God's holiness, his internal attribute of holiness, this is what we call an archetypal law. It's the ultimate pattern for governing who we are and what we should be. God is the archetype. His holiness is the archetype. But then, that's, that's internal righteousness. We call it archetypal law. Well, when God expresses it to us, now it's external righteousness. So when God's, when God's <coughs> righteousness is manifest externally, what do we call that? The law of God. Okay? So, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Uh, you name it, all of that is giving propositions to, to righteousness, the way things ought to be. So, so in this case, we think about external righteousness. <clears throat> That's going to come in two forms, natural law 
and then law given in special revelation. It's two places God has told us the way things ought to be, and it doesn't change. So that's why Paul says, the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Why? Well, where does it come from? God. Nothing wrong with the law of God. The only problem with it is we can't keep it. Right? So, so as we look at that, if you've got a different view of law, then you're forgetting that this comes from God. There's nothing wrong with the law of God. It, it's a statement of his perfect holiness given to us. So, so there, we, we think about certain issues like, all right, now, how do we understand the big stuff here, such as <coughs> law versus justice? And here's one of those areas that, and think about it here. We have, with the righteousness of God, we have an antecedent righteousness and a consequent righteousness. And again, the idea of the choice. Antecedent, remember, is something that comes before. And what's that? Law. God gives us notice of the expectation. Okay? And to make sure we, we didn't miss it ever, God wrote it on our hearts. Okay? No one can say, I didn't get the memo. Okay? Uh, everyone got the memo. And you don't need to appeal to Scripture. You can just look at how people live, and everybody acts as if they know there is an objective universal moral law. So this is, imp this is important, the concept of notice, because if you're not notified of the expectation, how can you really be blamed for not keeping it? Right? And so again, that's why God made sure he let us all know. So on this side... I think about that as, 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 again, it's antecedent righteousness. It comes before God gives us the expectation. Now, consequent righteousness, we really talk about as particular justice. Giving people what they merit, what is due to them, for either obedience or disobedience to the expectation. Okay? So particular justice, in other words, you're giving people what they deserve. If they obeyed the law, there is remunerative justice, rewardance in accordance to obedience. And if you disobey the law, it's retributive justice. Okay? Okay. And so here, it just comes down to it. You're either rewarded for your obedience to the expectation or you're punished for disobedience. Now, this is called a number of things. Well, it's called particular justice. Uh, in this case, a number of the Protestants baptized Aristotle again and uh, took his categories of universal and particular justice because it seemed to fit the biblical data, according to them which I think it does. I think it, it probably does. You recognize something that seems to be true of human nature. But see, we talk about universal justice. That means being a just person, okay? So it's more like the, the attribute of being just. So it's a, it's, it's a virtue that you should inculcate, being just, inclined to being just. We're here, <coughs> we're looking at... Um, Particular justice, also sometimes called distributive justice. And let me give you an example of particular justice, okay? Um, distributive, particular, remunerative economic justice. Your paycheck, okay? All right, see, now law can come in a lot of forms. One way is covenant. You make an agreement to, to, to do something, okay? Now, 
you and your employers have agreement. You do the work, they pay you, okay? That's why at the, whatever your pay period is, let's say the end of the month, after you've done all that work, then your employer gives you a gift of your paycheck, right? Just say no, I, I know it's after lunch and everything, but come on, man, work with me. Yeah, no, that's not a gift, that's what is owed to you, okay? Now what happens if your employer doesn't pay you? Well, pitchforks, torches, I know that, all that, but uh, uh, yeah, what do you do? You go, they've, now they've done an injustice. You're not giving someone what is due to them. So where do you go to make sure that justice is done? You know, now you have to appeal to the people who are put in place to ensure justice is done. And in our system, we have an objective system in the courts to ensure that. Uh, so, <clears throat> although, well, there are courts, so they're not perfect, so you don't, that's why they're called courts of law, not courts of justice, so don't, don't always expect to get justice there. Okay, now that's remunerative justice, all right? Retributive justice, you break the law, again, you murder someone, you know, you go to jail, and ultimately, if it's the right case, you're, you know, death penalty, that's punishment for breaking the law. Okay. That's a, a case of particular retributive justice. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, life for life. So now as you <coughs> consider that, okay, we have God's archetypal law, which is his attribute of holiness. But what's ectypal law? And you know, there's only two sources, as I said, natural and special revelation. If I had more time, I would flesh out what's on page three and four, uh, the um, types of ectypal law, natural and mosaic. But I, I only just want to give a couple of statements about this. So, for example, natural law is actually the answer to what about the people who have never heard? Well, the heavens declare the glory of God, they have heard of God, and God told them what to do, and they don't do it. So, if God did not punish people for sin, he would be unjust, because that's what people deserve, okay? Now, and that's why we'll see when we get to the doctrine of the atonement here, uh, is that, first of all, you might note that God is 100% justice. Because if you look at the doctrine of hell, those are people who are experiencing particular retributive justice based on their unrepentant sin. But what's Christ's work on the cross as a penal substitution? That's vicarious justice. God himself is bearing the penalty. So God is very concerned with justice. Either he's bearing it or you're bearing it. But either way, everybody gets what's due. Either the substitute's bearing it or you're bearing it. So God is pretty interested in the notion of justice. Now, but that's where just simply, what about people who've never heard? They're not being punished because they haven't heard the name of Jesus. They're being punished because they freely sinned. That's why people are being punished. So that's like saying, you know, it's unfair that the governor of the state of California doesn't offer everyone in prison a pardon. You didn't have to, okay? While you have the powers of clemency, and if you look at what a pardon is, it's simply, as the uh, legal head of the state, the governor can decide that the state, the people collectively, will bear the harm caused by that person's crime and will choose not to hold it against you anymore. It's actually a form of vicarious atonement. So the state bears the harm. And now you're let off for whatever, and hopefully we have good reasons for it. But, but to say it's not fair has nothing to do with fairness. Deciding to give a gift of someone a vicarious satisfaction, uh, bearing their harm for sin, is just that. It's a gift. It doesn't have to be offered to anyone. But the fact that you do, it's a matter of discretion. It's a matter of charity. It's a, it's a gift. So, and in the case of sin... It costs something. The people who are harmed choose to bear the harm. Okay? 
and we do that through our representative heads. So, <clears throat> so on that, that's natural law. Now, on Mosaic law, actually, I did a church-state series at my church where I, I covered the three, uh, three divisions of the law for probably about, I don't know, 20 weeks or something in my class. So uh, if I ever get those CDs together, I'll put them online somewhere. But um, Christians disagree what aspects of the law are still around. You're not going to get a single answer uh, on this. But minimally, let's start with, look, if God revealed it, it's probably something we should be, don't just immediately say, well, that's, that's Old Testament stuff. Really? So what God said in the Old Testament, because based on his nature, talking to people, it's completely irrelevant, right? I'd be, be careful about that. You know, uh, It's the same God in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. And this is why when we think about law, remember before the break, I talked about that principle rule distinction. Fact is, is that, look, if you get in the Old Testament theocracy of Israel, yes, that was a specific people in a specific historic situation at a specific time. So there are certainly going to be certain laws, like the ceremonial laws, you know, all of these, you know, special laws where uh, the Levites have to do certain kinds of sacrifice. At that point, look, when Christ has come, what is sim symbolized in the Old Testament looking forward, we're done. It's one sacrifice for sin forever, and he sat down at the right hand of God. So as a general rule, people agree, yeah, ceremonial, there's just no more ceremonial. Don't have to eat kosher. In fact, that's all. Remember Acts 10, Peter's vision of his flying pork chops and all of that. You know, um, you know, just look, don't, don't worry about that anymore. He gets okay. Uh, other passages, you know, it says, thus he cleansed all food. At the same time, uh, you know, eating lots of uh, pork, bacon, da, 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 you know, it's probably not good for this for, for your body. Now that we know it's not good to have that much cholesterol and this and that. And found out that God's diet that He gave in the Old Testament is a pretty good diet. You know, it's it's you know, so let's not just quickly throw off maybe the wisdom. But while it's not mandatory now, you can still learn a lot from it. Okay, because this is God's uh, diet book that He gave people. Uh, so. So that said, you know, again, um, but so that's ceremonial law, arguably. But then the, uh, the civil law, you know, they needed a law to run the nation of Israel. Okay, well, guess what? If your ox gores someone, how much do you have to pay? Okay, well, guess what? While we don't have a whole lot of oxen running around La Mirada goring people, um, you know, again, you know, that, you know, that, but that might be, you know, if you're an agrarian community or something happens. So the point is, we say, according to God, this kind of harm results in at least this kind of settlement penalty. So you can at least measure, start to see how God thinks about measures of justice. And again, even though it's not mandatory on subsequent cultures, it can be a helpful guideline. Now, now the argument, at least by most of the Protestant groups, is that while the, the ceremonial and the civil law have been abrogated, because uh, A, because we Gentiles are not, you know, we're, we're not uh, part of the, the commonwealth mosaic nation of Israel. We're not Jews. We're not bound by that specific time and culture. Yet the moral principles are always in place. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. Uh, those never go away. Um, doesn't matter. Well, we're no longer under law, but under grace. Oh, that means you can rape, murder, steal, right? No. Uh, still, the moral law of God is what? Remember, it's an it's a external expression of God's internal holiness. So do not murder, okay? Do not steal. Do not, you know, covet your neighbor's donkey, uh, nor his uh, disco machine. Definitely not. But... Uh, <laughs> So the thing is, okay, so God has given us these propositions or precepts. So, so the idea is, look, the moral law of God is the moral law of God. But even with that law, we think of the New Testament of uh, namos and a, uh, 
See, if you want to study the law of God, learn how to be holy, we don't necessarily willy-nilly take every instance in the Old or New Testament and say, well, that's the rule we have to follow. Again, right back to principle and rule. Rules are for, again, applied principles. But, but in every rule, there is a principle that is the ground of it. So that's why a good nomologist, see, what are you supposed to do? Look at the law of God and say, well, what's, you know, that may have been true in the first century. It's not necessarily true now, but what's the principle behind it? Okay. Um, and again, so that, that's doing it properly without sort of taking pharisaical rules and laws and, you know, just applying it in everyday life. <coughs> but the key is, is that extremes to avoid. Holiness is whatever I think it is and what I want it to be. <laughs> no, it's not, okay? Or, complete other side, you know, that somehow every rule, specific rule in every culture that God ever uttered is currently uh, appropriate today. Well, that can't be true. Let me give an example why. Um, for example, uh, is it true that the law of God and almost every law around today says uh, you can't marry your sister, brother, or your first cousin? Incest. Just not. It's right. Yes. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. The, the Bible says that. You're, I don't know. Is that true? Yeah, it's true. Okay. <laughs> so that's what it says. All right. But, but this, is, this is actually an issue that people bring up that supposedly it's a contradiction in the Bible. Well, didn't Adam and Eve's children intermarry? Well, see, so it's a contradiction in the Bible. See, God says it's okay to commit incest here, but it's not here. It's a contradiction. So God doesn't exist, so, yeah, you know, I'm going to I'm gonna do whatever I want. So when, when the reality behind it is um, no, see, if you actually look at the era, uh, you see, look at right after the fall, of course, we, we know why we prohibit incest now, because um, with our genetic code, we know that there are, when you down the line here, if you marry someone too close to your family line, these recessive traits uh, are too easily paired in the genome structure that can result in all sorts of you know, terrible things. That's why we forbid you know, the intermarrying of people, brothers, sisters, and producing offspring um, in these close family lines. So, but why was it that Adam and Eve's children could do that? And the answer was because the the, the human genome had not subdivided enough to produce these recessive traits or been defective enough. So the real principle is don't engage in any marriage where you're likely to produce biologically defective offspring. And so that was not true right after the fall of man. It's true at least a number of generations later. So, so, it's the, same. so the principle remained the same don't engage in marriages, they're going to likely to produce harm and biologically defective offspring. So that's why you couldn't do it later, you know, marry your sister or first cousin, or cousin but you could uh, at the beginning. So again, that's just a simple principle rule distinction. But people raise that as a contradiction with the Bible, which can be solved by this, again, nomological uh, approach of principle and rule. So. Is everybody awake still? Okay, good. So, yeah, pretty much. So, uh, <laughs> actually, the uh, New Testament word is nomikos. Okay, my brother has that license plate, so uh, uh, he's the other half of the law office of Lewis and Lewis. Uh, so, but anyway, so if you see uh, a, a silver Nissan Altima with nomikos on the back, just throw some stuff at it and uh, just, uh, you know, so, yeah, get to the stoplight, go like this and go, are you a lawyer? Yeah, go away. All right, so, yeah. All right, so, yeah, he lives right around the corner here, so you just might see the Nomicos mobile. Uh, so, all right. So that's a, um, a little bit. The thing is, look, law, there are two things that affect your life the most, and that's God and government. Um, I mean, literally, it's, you know, law, salvation, things like this. So we really, it's people who don't think about it uh, are tough. Also, too, it's actually, 
the people who know the law are the most free. Okay? That seems contradictory, but see, if you know the law, then you know your boundaries. So you know what you can and can't do. Also, uh, if you know what God said the law is, then humans making up rules, you know, it's like, you know what, that's, God says I can do this. So who are you to tell me I can't? Okay. Uh, God says I can't do this, and guess what? You can't say I can. So by knowing the law of God, you're actually more free. You know where your boundaries are. You know, you know where the human made-up pharisaic, pharisaical rules are. And, uh, and you know where true Christian liberty is by knowing that. So, and the problem is, is that like the Pharisees in every age, whether then or now, uh, people in the church always want to put new yokes on people that God didn't place. So that's why carefully studying the law of God is actually freeing. Uh, so but then you don't have to worry if you're sinning. You know when you are, but you're like, I don't know, did I sin? Well, know this stuff, and then you, you won't have to worry about it. So anyway, I could say more on that, but so um, civil, ceremonial, moral, probably make a good case as a general rule. Look, clearly, I, th I think the moral law of God is still around because it's, it's, while we don't have to offer drink offerings, we still can't murder someone. Okay, so that's an area to think about. Now, <coughs> um, things to say about the law of God. Probably the clearest thing as we think about it, it's attributes. Lots and lots to say about that. According to Scripture, page 4, it's perfect, it's majestic, it's immutable, and it's holy. Okay, nothing wrong with the law of God because it reflects the character and nature of God. Also, hasn't been abolished, according to Christ uh, and others. He says, uh, Christ said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. So, um, uh, he says, Moses and the prophets are useful for us. Matthew 22, Jesus encouraged keeping the whole law. Um, Paul uh, says the law is beneficial. Faith establishes the law. Um, First Timothy, Paul says the law is good if one uses it lawfully. So, so it's only the antinomians, the people who want to do whatever they want to do. We don't want to think about the law of God anymore because I want to be a law unto myself. And you might want to note on a second that the anti one of the titles for Antichrist is Anamos, the lawless one. So, so if you want to be an antinomian, uh, say there is no law that governs you uh, except what, what you make up at any given moment. Well, good luck with that. You're in good company with the other lawless one, um, which you don't want to be. Quick question, we got to move on. Yeah, that's one. That's one we could have about three hour discussion on. Um, and that it's an important one because I'll, I'll just say this. Um, there are a lot of Christians who don't even think about the Sabbath anymore. But yet, remember, the Sabbath is prior to the fall. The Sabbath is a rule that says God rested on the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy because the way he designed as limited creatures in the body, they get tired. We need a day of rest. We need a day of refreshment. We need to go in cycles. We need to do this. And that's prior to the fall. Now, the key, though, is that you get to Colossians 2. See, then the question, um, now, what does it mean? You know, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? Of course it is. See, people make up all these rules about what the Sabbath day should be. Um, you know, wait, I, I can't help, help somebody on the Sabbath, so it's not lawful to do good on the Sabbath? Um, and then your problem is, you know, Colossians uh, 2, Paul says, don't let anyone judge you what day you keep whether it's a full new moon or a Sabbath day. You know, fact is, we, I think you can make a case, we should keep a day. You get an entire understanding of what the Sabbath is. God designed us to have a day of rest and refocusing on him once every seven days because in a, in a fallen world especially, we need, to re, we need to rest and refocus you know, to function well. And when we don't, 
find out that it doesn't work out well for us. But at the same time, does it become mechanical? Well, you know, on this day, just happen to have a little too much to do, so I, I become a, you know, uh, you know, I take the Sabbath on the second day instead of the first day of the week or the seventh day or whatever day it happens to be. But again, like this, see, the point is, is that you go back to the Protestant Reformation, people thought long and hard about, well, what do we really think about? What is a Sabbath and all of that? Whereas our modern non-denominational church with its 10 or 12 line doctrinal statement, they barely think about anything else, um, including, you know, the, the concept of a Sabbath. So, so that's why uh, I was just double checking. It's like, did I plug my mic back in? Okay, good. So that Jimmy would come in with a pitchfork right now if I didn't. So, all right. So, <clears throat> so anyway, when you get to that, um, but even then, remember the very notion of law, law isn't a bad thing. It's something that's supposed to order and govern our lives properly to relate to God and each other well. But if you tend to think of law as bad and coercive, it's mainly it's because, well, because it's making me do something I don't want to do. <laughs> okay, when the fact is, is we should welcome w welcome the instruction of God. And here's one of these little tips. You've heard of the word Torah before, right? Just say, yeah, you've heard it. Yeah, it's the law, okay? Come on, man, work with me. All right, good. So, and it's translated law, but its basic meaning in Hebrew is instruction. It's instruction for living. That's what Torah was. So, it, so it really is, maybe you say, well, here's God's instruction book for us. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's God's instruction book for the human race. So, but see, for the person who doesn't want to do what God wants them to do, see, then law is restrictive, it's coercive, uh, and so forth, as opposed to saying, no, I, I want to know what's holy and good. I want to do the will of my maker. The question is, whatever you call it, is the creature seeking the will of the creator? So it's either I look at what God has already revealed that is holy, right, and good, or what am I going to have to expect? Moment by moment, special revelation to tell me what to do in every instance of doing right or wrong, which is going to be what? Law. <laughs> it's only being a given bit by bit instead of saying it's already given. So anyway, more on that, but we'll look at some of the, its applications. So, But some key passages are simply um, Christ didn't come to abolish the law, but fulfill it. Now, in that sense, move forward <coughs> and look at um, page six and talked about, you know, the remunerative and retributive justice. But this is a uh, huge concept here. Now, page six and seven are going to go together here. I want you to get this because if you get this, you'll understand the doctrine of the atonement and what's going on. Because what we have with Christ um, <coughs> is related to what? Taking care of the penalty for sin. All right. Well, let's look at the issue of supererogation and the law. Um, supererogation. Um, the argument is this. If you look at Law in a communitarian sense, okay? in a covenantal community, something that's supposed to govern personal relations and relationships. Okay? That's what's really at issue when we're looking at the law of God. This is how we're supposed to relate one to another. Okay? So it's communitarian. <coughs> now, look on page 7. So the statement here, what is a supererogatory act? It's an act one performs that is above the normal requirements and merits remuneration. Okay? But arguably, there are no meritorious supererogatory acts in a law based community. Okay? Let me unpack that. Now, what does that mean? Well, pretty simple. Uh, God says, be holy. Um, okay, that's your job description 100% of the time. What, what are you going to do above and beyond that that's going to merit something? 
The answer is absolutely nothing. Okay? Now, we're thinking about justice and how this works. Now, this is why guilty of one, guilty of all. All it takes is one. Okay, here's why. Because when you're talking about maintaining a relationship that's righteous, based on righteousness, based on goodness, maintaining in any communitarian sense, whether it's one-on-one -on -one relationship or a larger community, um, there are no super arrogatory acts. Law is law. See, your duty as a citizen of the state is to do what? Be 100% obedient to the law all the time, period. You don't get any freebies, okay? If it's enacted as legislation, then your job is to do what? Keep all the law all the time. And if you do, what's the remuneration for keeping the law? Simple, you get to maintain the full relationship in the covenant community, okay? See, if, you're, if you keep all the law being in the state of California, what do you get? You get to remain free, participating member in the state of California, okay? There's no restrictions. Same thing with one-on-one. Um, -on -one. If, if I'm kind to my wife, I get to maintain the full benefits of a marital uh, relation with her. And the problem is now, <clears throat> This is to show that there's no such thing as super irrigation. A um, couple examples I gave here, and that is, let's say you're late to class and you decide you're gonna run a couple of red lights, you get ticketed, and then uh, all of a sudden you run the red light, cop pulls you over, and, you know, go to court, and you say, your honor, you know, I shouldn't have to pay the fine for running the red light, and uh, says, why? Well, you gotta understand, Your Honor, that right before I went through the red light, I went through 10 green ones, and then after that, I went through 10 green ones. So I got a 10 to one ratio of green lights to red lights. So, so I shouldn't have to pay the fine. And case two, a murderer goes to court and says, yeah, Your Honor, but I shouldn't have to go to jail for this. Well, why? Well, I let everyone else in the community live. See, I, I kept the law with respect to all the other stuff, okay? And <clears throat> now that's when the judge says, would you like to submit an insanity plea at this point? Because <laughs> that's not the way this stuff works. But yet, what I just said is what every world religion says we're gonna do to come before God. We're gonna offer up what we should have been doing in the first place to pay for our sins, okay? that we've done enough, quote, good works to merit um, paying for our bad works. But see, that assumes super irrigation, which in any communitarian relationship, there is no super irrigation. One sin breaks your shalom, breaks the peace, breaks the full participation with the community. Now, from going to more general to specific, and I gave this in my Monday night lecture, but... Um, if I go home today, I'm in a bad mood, and hypothetically, this is hypothetically, I, I go home and say, you know what, honey, you're just, I hate you. You're ugly, your cooking stinks, and uh, I don't know why I married you. Sheesh, you know. And then, you know, there will be no shalom in the home. Uh, <laughs> you know. Now, let's just say, but before that, I just clean and pure as the wind-driven snow. I had a perfect relationship with my wife. But... She wouldn't be upset with me and we wouldn't have a broken relationship at that point because I'd been good before, right? Yeah, right. No, how, how many times did it take for me to be unholy to break my shalom with my wife? Once, that's all it takes. And um, so that's why, uh, you know, so, okay. But so now think about the works righteousness scenario that goes along with that. So now I... Uh, you know, she's still mad at me. You know, she's not talking to me and everything. She's kind of real sad, weepy. So then I go and take out the trash. I go bring dinner home. Uh, and then, you know, so you say, all right, ugly, now you got to take me back. Stop whining. See, I, I took out the trash and brought dinner home. And does that mean she has to make up with me, right? Unrepentant, 
you know, I did what I was supposed to do in the first place, but you know, no, that's not gonna fix the relationship. Um, now, see, that's why, again, whether it's Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, anything like that, so I look, your works can't save you. No amount of works, uh, which by the way, that's what Paul says, he says, if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly, okay? Uh, we can't be saved by works. Uh, it's impossible because salvation is what? It's forgiveness and reconciliation of a broken relationship. It, that's it. So how do you reconcile a broken relationship? It's only one way. Okay? The offended party has to do what? Choose to bear the harm that was caused by the offending party and not hold it against him. Okay? That's it. So in other words, they take the penalty. They satisfy the harm, so they're substitutionary satisfiers of your sin. And then what, what, what is it that you can do? <coughs> Nothing to earn it. You have to want the relationship. Now, but what are you going to have to do to have a real relationship again? You have to repent and confess your sin and then know of an offer of reconciliation. Come, trust that there's an offer of reconciliation, and then when you express your repentance and confession and you want to have a holy relationship again, that's when the transaction occurs of reconciliation, okay? But it's not by work, it can't be by works. It's only by vicarious burden bearing and repentance and confession. Then eHarmony.com, again, you know, two, two can walk together as one. So, but that's it. That's the only way you're going to fix a broken relationship. Now, now, I gave the scenario of works righteousness, okay? Now, so that's, you know, see, if I offend my wife, that's between me and my wife. Nobody else has anything to do with that. I have to repent and confess. And only my wife the offended party can bear the burden. So now think about the weird stuff about having third people involved in it, okay? Well, because, all right, <clears throat> against whom do we sin? God, okay? So God is the offended party, okay? Now we are the offending party, okay? So, so we sin against God. What's the wages of sin? Death, okay? So, and that's both spiritual and physical. God is more than just our friend. He's the moral governor of the universe. There's a lot of things that are going on. So we analogize broken personal relationship broken shalom in the community, offense against, you know, what's right. There's multiple levels at which we relate to God. But now, all right, <clears throat> my sin is against God. All right, so if God is going to save us, which is what? Forgiveness and reconciliation. We deserve to be separated from God. But so what does God do? Well, God's going to bear the harm. Okay, but the wages of sin is, say it, death. death. All right, can God die as God? Just say no. So, yeah, that's what I hear up here. No. Okay, good, yeah. The divine nature can't die. So, but yet God's the offended party, so he has to bear the harm. So what do we need? Christmas, okay? So God has to become a man without ceasing to be God so he can bear the burden because only the offended party can do that. Again, Matthew 9, 5, Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Hey, who can forgive sins but God? And then Rabbi Jesus said, aha, right? Okay, good. So exactly, only God can forgive sins and bear the burden. So, so this is why... Again, the logic of the necessity of the incarnation, okay? Uh, for, for, for him to actually accomplish salvation, he's got to become a man without ceasing to be God. Now, 
Think of the absurdity in these scenarios of having Christ as less than God. He's an angel or a man. What does that make him to this sin that we have against God? He's a third party. He's just another human being. Now, let, let's give that as an atonement theory, okay? Um, now, my wife and I have a beef. So now my next door neighbor comes over, mows our lawn, takes out our trash, and says, now you two have to make up. <laughs> what? What are you doing here? Get out! So, I mean, literally, that's just, what? It, no, really, I, I just mowed your lawn and took out your trash, so you guys have to make up now. Then both of us would kick you out and start fighting again, right? You're just insane. But literally, the idea of a, if Jesus is not God incarnate and he's an angel or a man, he's a third party and it's the equivalent of your next door neighbor mowing your lawn and saying, now you have to make up, okay? Jesus is a man or an angel. He has nothing to do with my problem that I have with God. He has his own, you know, <laughs> he has his own problem or not problem, but he's not helping me with my problem. And of course, in those scenarios, that's why whether you're an Arian or dynamic monarchian. See, this is why Jesus isn't really bearing the harm for sin. That's why everybody wants to get rid of penal substitution. I don't like the idea of divine justice, or I don't like the idea of that, because God isn't really punishing. So there is no punishment to bear. So what does Jesus become? He's not the way, he's just a way shower. He's just a prophet. He's giving us some new love teaching, but he's not actually a priest where he's bearing the harm for sin. He's not the sacrifice for sin. So, so that's why, like I said, in those scenarios, all of those become just silly when you think about when the goal of it is to um, reconcile a broken relationship. So that's why super arrogatory acts are simply make it impossible. Okay. So... Um, <clears throat> And guess what? That's exactly what the scriptures say. Romans 4.15, the law brings about wrath. And by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. So, so that's why when we look at those statements about law in the scriptures. Exactly. That's why through the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. That's why all it takes is one to break your shalom with God. Okay. Because the result is a lack of these things. All right, so a couple other things before we move on. Um, now that so when we look at the doctrine of the atonement. What is Christ doing? Right, Christ. So you look at what he's doing on the cross. It is a substitutionary retributive justice. The wages of sin is death. So what is he doing as our substitute? Okay? He's bearing the wrath of God okay, in our place. But does this come in? Remunerative justice. All right. Remember, what does it take for us to live in the kingdom of God? Perfect obedience to the law all the time. In fact, that's the, the law of paradise. As long as Adam and Eve perfectly kept the law, what was their remuneration? They stayed in Eden. Okay? So, so this is where, so what does Christ come to? He didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. So Christ does what? He fulfills the law in our place and and not everybody agrees on this, by the way. It's to be called Christ's active obedience. Here is his active obedience to the law. This would be his, called his passive obedience, the yeah, atonement theory. And in this case, now because our substitute has essentially fulfilled the law in our place, this might take us out of uh, the penalty box, but does it grant us a permanent place in the kingdom? Because what does it mean to have a permanent place in the kingdom? It means that you've passed probation and that you've, you've, you've fulfilled the law. You keep the law. So according to at least a majority of Protestants, both of these are imputed to us. 
This takes away our penalty. This gives us a positive place in the kingdom, okay? And so th both of those guarantee us a place, but both of those are part of Christ's atoning work. Now, for those who don't believe in active obedience, now you think about this as a concept. What are we talking about here? The sinlessness of Christ, okay? What does it mean that Christ is sinless? Well, minimally, he obeyed the law. He never sinned. So, now this is a big difference between Protestant theology and Roman Catholic theology, for those of you who are, uh, have studied that, because according to Roman Catholic theology, I mean official confessional Roman Catholic theology, say Christ is sinless and he fulfills the law not to impute to us, but only so that he can do this. Because what if Christ had sinned? Okay. If he had sinned, he couldn't offer up his death as a substitutionary merit. He would owe a penalty for his own sin. Okay. So in this case, his death, only Christ, because he's sinless, can, can do this work of supererogation, of offering up his death in our place. Okay. So in that case, by bearing the burden. Now, in that case... Um, that's what Christ offers us. But this is where in Roman Catholic theology, what you've got now is, okay, because his obedience is not imputed to us, well, now what's required of you? Temporal obedience. Okay? So this is where now if, you, now if you've sinned, what do you have to do? You have to go to confession. You have to do these things. Otherwise, you're, you're accruing merits and demerits based on your temporal obedience and disobedience. And this is where, based on that, and, and again, the merit system, it's called condigned merit, congruent merits, and uh, all of these. This is where it has to do with whether or not this is reckoned to your account. And if you haven't taken care of all your temporal demerits, then what do you do? You're going to purgatory. Okay. So, so again, part of the, the very doctrine of Purgatory relates to Christ's active obedience and whether or not it's actually imputed to us or not. So, so again, as you work out the system. So all of that, again, we start thinking about the doctrine of the atonement itself. How law and justice work completely points us to what's going on in Christ's life and uh, what's going on on the cross. So uh, to understand it. But mainly, if you want to get it and understand the atonement itself is in this communitarian sense that if you want to reconcile a broken relationship, it has to be done through penal substitution. You have to bear the, the harm, you know, the penalty for someone else so, uh, to reconcile with them. Okay? Now that becomes, as we'll see when we get to the doctrine of the atonement, that's a first step that anyone does. Um, on these things. Now, subsequent to that, we see reconciliation. We see people, you know, redeemed, uh, purchased out of the slave market of sin. But step one is, I, I got to be willing to bear the harm. The applied areas of the doctrine of the atonement are all these other areas, but it's got to first come through grace uh, and first come through these things, which, by the way, since you know you can't do good works yourself, to demand that someone reconcile with you, and a third person can't do it. Here's the point. If you can't do it, if it's going to be done at all, who's going to do it? A substitute, the one you've offended. And since you can't earn it, it's necessarily by grace. It has to be a gift because it can't be earned. It's something that someone just has to decide to do for you okay, to bear your burden. So, so again, the logic, see, as I said, Christianity answers all these questions well, and these other systems of pantheism and karma and works righteousness, they make no sense, okay? So this is the only thing that really makes sense of what salvation is and what we really want is the love of God and, and so forth. All right, uh, it's a good time to take our break, so go ahead and take a break. Uh, five minutes, which I know will be 10 minutes, but go ahead and... Uh, Take a break now.